Welcome to Thought Crime and Keto Crime, where Tracy does the sleuthing so you don't have to. Hey everyone, welcome to Keto and Crime and Thought Crime. Thank you for joining me today. Today we are going back to uh, the Chad Daybell book series with book two of his Standing on Holy Ground, Times of Turmoil series entitled Martial Law. Okay, uh, just a little preface to this. Be f for those of you that are concerned about me actually giving money to Chad Daybell, I actually bought a couple of these used. One of them I did. Another one I did download, Audible. I did pay, I believe, $7 for it, which means he's probably getting a grand total of about $6 for me. So I don't think it's it's going to fill his coffers too much. So I just wanted to leave everybody, because there seemed to be a lot of interest in finishing the book series. So I will be doing all of them. The, the last, this one as well as the last two. And I will also be reviewing probably tomorrow a copy of a podcast I was able to find starring Lori and our good friend Melanie Gibb. So I'll kind of be reacting and talking about that tomorrow. But um, also just wanted to also shout out to everyone, all my new subscribers, as well as those of you that have been so kind to comment uh, on the videos. I uh, just want to let you know that I am, as far as talking about LDS Church or Mormonism, I am speaking directly from these books that I am reading and what little bit of rudimentary knowledge I have. I'm not meaning to insult anybody that's LDS. I think I've made it abundantly clear that Chad Napel is definitely fringe if he's LDS at all. So um, I'm quite sure that his opinions do not reflect the opinions of most mainstream LDS members. So I just want to put that out there. I'm not trying to come down hard on anybody. And with that being said, as always, your subscription always helps the channel. Also, if you hit that notification bell down there to get all videos, that way you'll know when I upload. I upload on average about three times a week. Also, my channel is heavily demonetized because I am a true crime channel. So if you want to check out the links below to my Patreon, my Cash Out, PayPal, all that good stuff's down there, as well as my comedy album. I am a stand-up comedian that tours the country under normal circumstances. I'm coming to you today from uh, near Sarasota, Florida. We're here for a, a family vacation we'd already paid for, so I am going to be continuing to bring you some stuff, hopefully some stuff from the beach, too. So, anyway, but like I said, supporting the channel is never, monetarily is never, uh, required, always appreciated, but the most important thing you can do is hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm, leave a comment, and tell other people. So, with that being said, let's dive into it. Chad Day Bell's Martial Law. Right, as you'll recall, in book one, we left off with Nathan Foster and Marie Shaw trapped in a stained glass museum in Chicago with the entire world coming apart. Well, in the epilogue to this book, also written, written by Chad Daybell and narrated on Audible by his son, Seth. We find that the world is spinning into economic decay, at least the United States is. The Black Flu is ravaging coast to coast. A lot of homelessness due to um, Hurricane Barton, a hurricane that hit the southeastern United States during the first book. Uh, all oil wells are shut down. There's a fuel shortage. Um, the chips, which we heard, first heard about in the first book, where the government can actually track you, which I think that's ironic because the bodies on Chad Daybell's ranch were discovered because of cell phone GPS. So maybe he was right about that being his downfall. That's now mandatory and people that do not have it are being hunted down and forced to take it or imprisoned. And so with that, we pick back up. A lot happened in the week. These two have been in that stained glass window museum. 
So with that, we pick back up with Nathan Foster and Marie Shaw in Chicago. So they're trapped in the stained glass window museum. They're talking about how to get back to Utah. So Marie actually suggests that they actually go back to her apartment in the Bloomingdale building, the one she abandoned when uh, everything kind of went to heck, because she keeps, she had stashed some bottled water and some canned pork and beans there, because pork and beans was her comfort food that she used to eat at night, and said that they go back there, she's hidden some actual cases of pork and beans and bottled water under her bed. She had them there for easy access, I suppose. And if they go get those, they can load up and use that to give themselves nourishment as they try to make it back to Utah. Uh, Nathan agrees that this is a good idea, so they start out uh, toward the Magnificent Mile on Michigan Avenue in Chicago, where her office and apartment building was. And they notice that it's almost completely burned down. All the skyscrapers have either been on fire or are currently on fire. They see a lot of dead bodies, a lot of general misery along the Magnificent Mile, but they do make their way to the Bloomingdale building, which surprisingly is still intact. So they take the stairs and they manage to make it all the way up to the 26th floor where her apartment was, and they go inside. Now it did make a point of saying that Marie tired out at the 10th floor and Nathan carried her up the rest, so romantic. So they did make it into her apartment, which was completely ransacked except for her bedroom. And underneath her bed, they did find that case of bottled water and that case of pork and beans. And they open it and they each eat a can of pork and beans. And then they kind of start making fun of each other because instead of getting a spoon, they just sort of drank it down. If you've ever seen a can of pork and beans, it has a lot, a lot of liquid in it. And then they make fun of the fact that Nathan has some of it caught in his beard because he hasn't been able to shave in a while, so he has a long beard. And then they go into the bathroom to see if he can wash it off. He inadvertently turns on the bathroom sink. Of course, no water comes out because all utilities are off. And he starts to, he opened the top of the toilet and washed his beard in the water in there. And then, or took some water out, put it in a container and wash there and then they they basically put the rest of that water into a jug for washing later on and marie makes a comment about kind of nasty and he explains to her because women in this book don't know their butt from a hole in the ground uh that that water's technically pretty clean but don't drink the water in the bowl as if anybody with common sense wouldn't know that come on chad your misogyny showing just a little bit dude they laugh a little bit, and then uh, Marie falls asleep in the bedroom. Nathan sits down at a window to watch people walk, the few people that are still walking down the street. He watches them, and then he dozes off. And from there, we cut to Marie's father, Aaron Shaw, who you remember, worked for the NSA in their data processing center, and he's actually logging in to check Marie's chip to see if she was still alive. And then we go through this long explanation of if a person is alive, when the NSA logs into their chip, it says awake. If they're dead, it says asleep. And he checks her, it says she's alive and she's actually in her apartment, which to him is a great relief because he knows that she was, for the last few weeks, has been in the uh, museum. And now she's back in her apartment, he can only guess that Nathan has found her and they've gone back to her apartment to perhaps get some stuff out of there. So he's glad that it's obvious his daughter is alive. And from there he goes back to his normal job of scanning chips of people that were admitted to hospitals in the Los Angeles area of California once the black flu hit. You remember there was an earthquake in California that kind of ruined everything and then the black flu hit because of Dragon, remember our Chinese agent Dragon that released it in parts of the United States. He had, he had helpers that released it in other parts of the United States, and then you have this mutated form of black flu, sounds a lot like the flu that made everybody sick. So his job now with the NSA is to scan the chips of people that were admitted to the 
Southern California area hospitals to check their status, and he starts checking them, most of them being determined as asleep or dead in Chad Daybell's world. He then comes upon two names on his list that he knows, Garrett and Vanessa Foster. This is Nathan's father and stepmother, and remember, his little half-sister is actually staying with them because his parents had gone to California to rescue some family members and had both caught the black flu and no one knew their whereabouts. So these ended up on his on his list and of course Nathan found his little sister in their house and took them took her to live with the Shaws and she's been staying with them. But now he sees her mother and father and Nathan's father on his list and he starts to check them. And Vanessa comes up as a sleep or deceased. Her location is the parking lot of a hospital in Pasadena, California. And according to the NSA reports, the death toll is so huge in Southern California that they are actually stacking the dead bodies in parking lots and outside instead of putting them in morgues. So they're literally just stacking dead bodies out in the elements. So he then enters in Garrett Foster's information and it actually comes up awake and he's really shocked because his location is also showing as that same parking lot as Vanessa and he's wondering how could his chip be reading that he's alive when he's stacked in the morgue slash parking lot. And then of course we cut to Garrett who wakes up in the parking lot. He somehow has survived the black flu. He kind of wakes up, he's kind of groggy, he looks at his skin, he notices that he still has all the bruises from the black flake, the black flu turning your skin dark colors, he still has all those splotches, and he looks around and he's literally in a graveyard of sorts with dead bodies in all states of decomposition all around him. And he manages to get to his feet, he's dizzy, he's nauseous, but somehow he survived the flu. He kind of, as a lot of people do when they're in a terrible situation, he finds his faith. Again, remember, he was an excommunicated Mormon because he cheated on Nathan's real mother who was dying of cancer with his current wife, Vanessa, and he was excommunicated from the LDS church in Chad's world, not in real life. And so he finds his faith again momentarily, and he asks Heavenly Father or God, what he should do and he actually says he hears the spirit speak to him and tell him to go near a a little area of bushes and there he finds an unopened bottle of Gatorade on the ground so he picks it up he opens he breaks the seal he opens it he drinks some of it and he then he just sorts starts to kind of survey what was going on um he hopes that his wife's not dead, but he figures that she probably is, since they were both sick when they got to the hospital. He starts to walk out toward the sidewalk. He gets very nauseous, throws up, and then when he looks up, he sees a man riding toward him with a bicycle. The man has metal water cans hanging off the side of his bicycle. They're clanging. He tries to stop the man. The man does stop, but he points a gun at him and asks him, what does he want? And he just says, I'm just looking for information. I just woke up in this parking lot. I've been sick. I don't know what's going on. Can you tell me? And the man kind of tells him, you know, that all hell broke loose in California and everything went to crap, civilization collapse. And he's just on his way to get some water for his family. And Garrett asks him, well, where do you go to get water? And he goes, that's none of your business. And then he drives, he kind of pedals off. So... But what he did tell Garrett is that a lot of people left the cities and moved closer to the beach and they were all living down near the water where they where there was fish and, and other things that people could could survive on. So he start Garrett actually just starts walking south. He actually climbs up onto Interstate 110 and starts walking south toward Santa Monica Pier and that's where we leave him. We cut back to Chicago. It's the next morning, and Nathan is sleeping soundly at the window where he fell asleep, watching the, watching the people on the street below, and then he wakes up to somebody actually trying to get in the apartment. He hears the door rattling, somebody knocking on it, then he hears a key 
in the lock, and the door actually opens, and then the night chain catches it, and the guy outside is screaming Marie's name. Marie, Marie, I'm here to help you. And so Nathan jumps up, grabs his gun. He asks, he yells for Marie to get up. There's somebody out here. Marie comes running out of the bedroom about the time a guy enters the apartment. He's six foot two, about 270 pounds, pretty menacing looking guy. And he's wearing a NSA uniform. He tells them that his name is Sean. And he was looking for Marie because her chip was tracking here. And he was part of the chip compliance authority. And their job was to round up people that had their chips and bring them all to a central location so that they could start to restore some order in the world. Instead of having pockets of people hoarding things, they were wanting to bring everybody into a central location where they could divvy, divvy up supplies and stuff like that. They were looking for people. They were also looking for hoarded supplies that they could confiscate for the good of everyone. Well, Nathan, of course, holds him at gunpoint and says they don't plan to go with him. Neither do they plan to give up uh, the water and beans that they have for themselves. And Sean kind of taunts them and says, we well, really have no choice because people know where I am and they're going to be coming to look for me. So you're kind of, kind of stuck. Might as well just come along with me. And then Nathan says, well, we're not going with you, but I will get some information from you. And the guy starts snarling and Nathan pulls back the hammer on his gun and, or not the hammer, what is this, 1875? He lets him know that he's chambering a couple of bullets and he puts the gun up to his chest and says, you will tell me what you want because I have no qualms about killing you. So the guy kind of relents a little bit and then Marie walks into the closet, takes the cord off the vacuum cleaner, cuts it off and ties him up. So the guy's a little, little scared by now and he does, he does give them some information. Basically, he tells them that the world has gone to shit because of all the natural disasters, economic collapse, the black flu, and that they were just rounding up people to bring into a central location to help rebuild society. He also said that things were made worse because the government no longer could afford it and they cut off all unemployment benefits and welfare. So poor people were kind of in a bad way and there was a lot of lo looting and rioting. He also alluded to the fact that the gangster named Brick that we first met in the first book that was actually under NSA surveillance for being a criminal, they had actually allied with him and he was helping to restore order in Chicago and his men were actually working for the NSA and that he was technically in charge of Chicago and that they would be coming to look for him. So, Nathan says, well, we're not going with you, and we're going to, so he, he frisks Sean, the NSA guy, or the CCA guy, takes his two pocket knives that he finds on him. He also takes his chip detector, and he's about to gag him and put him in a closet so they can make their escape when the guy jumps up, kicks Nathan, and runs out. So they know that it won't be long until men come back looking for them. So they go into the bathroom. And they cut Marie's chip out because they don't need to see, have, be tracked. Basically what they do, it's in his, her left hand. Nathan takes a razor blade from a, re, a straight razor and cuts along the scar that was left on her hand from the insertion of the chip and pops it out and then crushes it, leaving it in the apartment. They then say, well, we got to get out of here. They bandage her hand. They take their... They take a little rollaway suitcase, they put all their supplies in it, and they roll towards the stairwell. They go down to the second floor where the mall that was in the Bloomingdale, Bloomington, Bloomingdale's building was, and they actually hear people rushing up the staircase. So they know that Brick or the you know, NSA CCA guys are there looking for them. So they duck into an old clothing store in the mall and wait for the people to pass. Once they've passed, they look around, they change clothes, they get clothes that are left on the shelves there, though there's not much. They also find a wheelchair that was there, like an oversized wheelchair for larger people. And they said, well, we can use this. So they put the beans along the foot area of 
the wheelchair. They have a disguised Marie sit in it. They also make a sign with cardboard and a magic marker that say black flu victim need help. And so they kind of just roll out of there with, with all that stuff. And of course, people avoid them because their sign says black flu. No one wants to catch it. So they use that to kind of start making their way out of Chicago. So we cut back to Garrett, Nathan's dad, walking towards Santa Monica. He's drained his Gatorade bottle and he's using the Gatorade bottle to get fresh water whenever he can find it. He's using the drippings off of overpasses and even some cleaner looking puddles for drinking water. He was going to stop and sleep in this minivan, but inside of it was a, a dead body of somebody that actually died from the flu. So uh, that qualmed his uh, desire to sleep in that minivan. So he ended up sleeping on the side of the interstate. Remember, he's walking along Interstate 110, a pretty long thoroughfare in the L.A. area. And so he actually makes it down to the exit where Santa Monica Pier is, and he's stopped by some armed men. Also, while he's walking, he's having this diatribe in his head about being the last uh, uh, Leomanite or Neophyte. Remember back, uh, we talked about in LDS lore, there's when in the New World, the lost tribes of Israel that ended up in North America, there were two different warring tribes, Neophytes and Lamanites. And actually, Lamanite is actually a tile, excuse me, but there were neophytes. But he likened himself to the surviving neophytes who were the good Mormons and how they buried the tablets that Joseph Smith would later find and share with his brother Hiram and create the whole faith. But he likened himself to their struggles and being like maybe the last Mormon left on earth is the way he was characterizing it. So he's thinking about these things as he approaches the exit for Santa Monica Pier, and he's approached by some armed men that tell him, ask him where he's going, and he says he's going to go down to the pier, hopefully to catch some fish and find some fresh water. And he said they're actually part of the group that is living at Santa Monica Pier, and they're under the command of a man named Sergeant Casey. And Garrett thinks for a minute, and he says, Spacey Casey? And the guys look at him, yeah, that's his nickname. And he goes, oh, I served in Afghanistan with him for two years. I know him very well. I knew he was from Southern California, but I had no idea. And then they relay the story of how he was a city councilman. And when everything hit, he kind of stepped up and helped take control of the little town and actually had set up headquarters in a, the Ralph's only remaining grocery store, Ralph's, and had locked everything down, used solar power to keep everything, all the power on in the grocery store, and had started rationing out food, and they had managed, with that, plus fishing and hunting, they had managed to keep their society somewhat alive. So, they said, well, since you're an old wartime buddy of him, we'll let you uh, go. So they tell him where to find him. He walks down the ramp. He walks Towards Santa Monica Pier, he passes this lady that offers him a piece of bread, and her name is Neva. She's the cook for the entire town, and he eats the bread, is very grateful. She also gives him some fresh water, and then asks where she can find where he can find the Ralphs. He tells her he's a friend of S Sergeant Casey. So she leads him to the Ralphs, and of course, Sergeant Ca his friend Sergeant Casey realizes that that's his old war buddy and they're happy to see each other and he invites him to join them and he actually gives him like a hamburger out of the Ralph's and feeds him and says you're welcome to join you just have to work here and he goes I'm ready to work I'll fish every day he says well that's the right attitude so he sat down and they each eat a hamburger and they reminisce and then Garrett asks about the possibility of possibly getting back to Oren, Utah, and he said, doubtful because of the condition of the interstates, and also, we don't know what's out there. I mean, this is our little world now, so the chances of you making it back to Utah on foot are pretty slim, so you might as well just join us, so Garrett says he will. Then we cut back to Aaron. Remember Aaron, Marie's dad, our NSA guy? where it's revealed, again, because in the first book we found out he was a double agent working for the LDS Church, 
within the NSA as well as working for the NSA. So he's feeding information to elders in Salt Lake City. And he does that by sending letters in the form of recipes, which is a coded language, to a certain elder named Bushman. And he, that's how he's giving information back to the church. So he's driving home from work and he's thinking about the letter he had just sent and he's, he's glad they have this coded language so nobody can really trace what they're saying. He gets home and Denise, remember uh, Nathan's little half-sister that's living with him, and, and his wife Carol are watching a news broadcast of a huge fire in Chicago. Pretty much the whole city of Chicago is on fire and everybody suspects it's arson and was done by a religious sect that was rebelling against being chipped. But Aaron, in his own head, says he knows that's not true because he knew about the fire. It was actually set by Brick and his gang. Remember, the guy that was once a gang member that is now working for the government, his people said it to make it look like the religious people said it. So, yeah. So we cut back to Nathan and Marie, who have walked as far as the suburbs of Chicago, and they come upon a abandoned country club. And they say, well, maybe we can rest here for the night. They go up, they try to get into the clubhouse. They can't. They even use the master keys that they had stolen from Sean, the CCA agent. That's how he was able to open her door. So even those keys don't walk. Uh, work, so they end up just going onto the golf course and sleeping under a tree. They're awakened by two security guards who'd found them because someone called and reported someone trying to break into the clubhouse, and they are taken by the guys because they, neither of them have chips, and the security guards consider that odd, so they take them up to the clubhouse, put them in the office, and say the club manager will be here to deal with them, and they will be calling the police because... You've got these people with a wheelchair full of food. They're not chipped, so it's a little bit of, sus of suspicion. Huge black guy. Those are his words, not mine. Comes in. He's very angry with them. He demands to know who they are, why they're at his country club, and what their intentions were. And they try to explain to them that they're just trying to get home to Utah. They're Mormons. They don't believe in the chip and they're just trying to get home, and can't they just go? And he says, no, we are law-abiding citizens here. We're going to turn you into the CCA because you don't have a chip. And then he kind of glares at them and says, but I, I want to know why you don't have a chip. And there's only one right answer to this. Why don't you have a chip? And they both explain to him that they're members of the LDS Church, they feel that the chip is a sign of the end times, could possibly be the mark of the beast. They don't want to be tracked. They just feel it's not right, and they are willing to die before they get the chip. Once they say that, this guy's eyes light up. He hugs them and tells them that he's not going to call the police. He just was testing them because he's the pastor of a Baptist church that is living at this country club, full of people that did not take the chip for the same reasons and that they are welcome to join them because they are about to leave and head for a Bible camp run by the Baptist Church in Springfield, Illinois, where they will try to wait all this out and live together. Well, of course, Nathan and Marie are happy. They say, of course, they will join them because they're actually trying to get as close to the Illinois-Iowa border as they can to make it back to Utah. So. They're just trying to get to an Illinois border and get out of Illinois. So they say, okay, yes, we will go with you. So he takes them down to the pavilion in the country club where they're living and immediately introduces them to everybody. They feed them. They give over their food to the people that they were carrying, just very generous. And the pastor, whose name is Haskell, Pastor Haskell and Nathan had this long conversation about faith and how faith is faith, and it shouldn't matter what church or what denomination you're in. They're all going to the same place. Meanwhile, Marie has gone over to where all the children are and offered to help babysit because in Chad Daybell's world, that's what women do. They simply take care of children when they're not accusing them of being zombies and killing them. They babysit them. 
And so she immediately makes friends with a little girl named Sylvia, who's four years old. And then they say, well, we're about to have a 4th of July celebration. I mean, I'm glad uh, that's patriotic and everything. And I, I plan to do fireworks myself on 4th of July, but it just seems an odd thing to throw in there. But they have some fireworks and they're going to shoot those off. And then the next day they're going to head out for Springfield. So they watch the fireworks. Then everybody goes to bed. The way his writing is, I mean, I know he's just trying to be very detailed, like a lot of great writers, but some of his details are completely uncalled for. I don't need to know that they went to bed. I would assume that they went to bed at some point. It's just Chad. Anyway, he's pulling a Chad. But anyway, so we cut to two months later. So we've gone from July to September. There's now an even greater gas shortage. Gas has shot up to $5 a gallon nationwide, which means it's probably 10 in California. And I remember when gas got that high uh, in Nashville several years ago when there was a pipeline that was damaged. So I, I can definitely empathize. And then we, he's also describing a political cartoon drawn in the New York Times that shows an American flag divided into four different sections with varying stages of decay to show how much trouble each section of the country was in. So you had the East Coast was coming unraveled because the government was falling apart. Then you had the Midwest that had sloths of burned material because of the Chicago fire and because of food shortages. Then you had the West Coast which had a huge tear down it, which because of the earthquake. And then you had the South that was still pretty well put together, but was still starting to unravel because even though you had a lot of good old boys and good old girls down there with guns that were hunting and staying alive, things were starting to devolve into tribalism. So it just kind of shows you that he's trying to illustrate that the country was in pretty dire straits. Then we cut to Garrett down at Santa Monica Pier, who has made quite a reputation for himself among his new, uh, new brothers and sisters in Santa Monica, that he's a good fisherman. He catches up to like six or seven really large fish every day out of the Pacific Ocean. And we cut to an episode where about six men came in from San Diego on foot looking for people to go back with them to help rebuild San Diego. They said that they were able to get their power and utilities back on due to uh, some solar and other things, and that they had youth power, they had running water, but they needed people to come and help them rebuild. And about 100 people volunteered to go back with them. Garrett and Sergeant Casey, were, whose first name is Landon, were a little skeptical they you know they didn't really trust people they're like okay i understand having utilities is great but also we don't know these men they could be leading us into some kind of ambush or you know forced labor slavery type of situation so but about a hundred people did go with them then we cut back to garrett who's gone back to fishing he catches a huge shark it takes four men to reel this thing in, and they decide because everybody caught a lot of fish that day that they'll have a celebration because there's a big announcement that Landon wants to make. So they barbecue up this shark, they barbecue up all the other fish, and they have this huge feast. And then Landon gathers them around and said that he heard over the shortwave radio that he's able to keep going with solar power that a superstorm, superstorm, it was part hurricane, part cyclone, part tornado. It was several tropical storms that had joined together. You think Grey's Anatomy season, what, eight, when that superstorm hit? If you watch Grey's Anatomy, that that's kind of what we're looking at. It's kind of part hurricane, part tornado, part cyclone, part typhoon, part nor'easter. Just bad. But it's a coming. It's a coming. It started on the coast of Russia and somehow traveled across the Atlantic, somehow cut into the Pacific, and is now going to hit the coast of California. Come on, Chad. You're pulling another Chad. Don't even know your geography. Anyway, 
Somehow the storm jumped oceans. And Landon told the people they need to move further inland, at least until the storm passes, and they can come back, because he doesn't know what it's going to do to Santa Monica Pier. But a lot of people want to stay because, as one guy puts it, I've spent a year getting my house the way I want it. I'm not going to leave because of one storm. With all we've been through, I can outlast one storm. I get that. I get that opinion. But this guy's also listening to the only existing radio in the area. But anyway, so about 40 people accompany Landon and, of course, Garrett, who go further inland. They go about, they hike several miles further inland. They find an abandoned house, and they all camp out in this house as the storm rolls in. And it is a super storm. They wake up, they start hearing trees fall, glass shatter, hail the size of baseballs. That's more like a softball, baseballs. And they start hearing a whole lot of damage. Landon and Garrett go out to kind of investigate what's going on. And Landon is killed by a falling tree limb that perfectly, you know, impales him. So he's killed. Garrett runs back inside. They all waited out in the house. When he wakes up, he's determined that now that his friend Landon is dead, he has no reason to stay here. He goes outside. He looks. He can see that Santa Monica Pier is completely gone. The pier itself is completely collapsed. All the homes that everybody had have completely flooded. So anybody that stayed probably died or has had to get out of there. So there's essentially nothing left. So he decides he's going to gather up what little bit of supplies he has and try to make it to Utah. And that's what he does. He gathers up and starts walking east toward Utah. Then we cut back to Aaron and Carol and Denise in Orin, Utah. Aaron gets a phone call 5 a.m. from his supervisor at the NSA Data Center telling him not to come into work today, that there's a superstorm coming. Remember the Atlantic Pacific hopping superstorm that just destroyed California again? is now coming towards Utah, and they weren't sure what kind of damage, so they didn't want to have people at work to stay home and batten down the hatches. Aaron and his family get up. Together, they batten down the hatches, and then the storm rolled in at noon. It pretty much flooded their town. Their house did survive, with just a few shingles missing, but a lot of people in their neighborhood lost their house, huge chunks out of their roofs, and they both said, it, and both Aaron and Carol said it was because they said a prayer to the Heavenly Father first. Nothing against the power of prayer, but come on, Chad. That's like saying, don't let a serial killer kill me, let it kill my neighbor kind of thing. Please, God. Anyway. So there was no power, of course. For some reason, Utah also has power when no other state does, pretty much. Anyway, um, they then have a conversation, Carol and Aaron, that it might be time for Carol and Denise to head on to the camps, and they start to formulate a plan for that to happen. Okay. Then we cut to Springfield, the Baptist camp, where Nathan and Marie are with the, their Baptist friends, and they've hiked 200 miles to make it. They only lost two people. They were an infant and an elderly man. Maybe they were zombies. I don't know, but that's who they lost on the march. And remember, not making fun of death, I'm making fun of fictional death, just so y'all know. Anyway, uh, Nathan has this long diatribe in his head about how he admires that Marie has repented from the sins of trying to have a career and a life outside the home. I'm paraphrasing. And that she has become a great mother figure. She's mothering Sylvia and these other kids and how he really admires that. Because again, in Chad Daybell's world, that's what women are good for. But let's not talk about the fact Tammy ran his entire publishing company and kept it afloat. But we're going we're gonna to forgive him that. He's a Chad. Anyway, Chad is like, to me, 
This Chad is like the male equivalent of a Karen. Just say. Anyway, so we they tell us that the, the Baptists are surviving by breeding rabbits and killing the rabbits. Okay, that's a great idea. And then one night at dinner, Pastor Haskell announces that a family among them has become affected with the black flu and they are being quarantined at one edge of the camp. So anybody that has been in contact with that family or is showing symptoms of the black flu themselves should immediately go to the quarantine, quarantine side, side of the camp. And unfortunately, Marie tells Nathan that that family are the cousins of Sylvia's family and she has been in contact with them. So Sylvia and Marie are quarantined. Oh, and then that tropical like superstorm, the jump, you know, the ocean jumping superstorm has actually made it to Illinois and has picked up power, ignoring all the rules of meteorology. It has picked up steam and it's about to hit the camp. So they all batten down in some of the meeting halls on the camp. They all survive with just a few broken windows, but then the next day, more people show symptoms of the black flu, including Patrick, uh, Pastor Haskell. So he has to go down and be quarantined. He does tell Nathan that he can't see Marie right now because she's resting. That's code for she's about to die. But Nathan hears a call in his spirit to go in and see her. So he does. He finds her on a cot with Sylvia, breathing very shallow, covered with the black bruising and the pus-filled pestules all over her body. And he hears another call from the spirit to lay his hands on her and lay a missionary's blessing on her. So he does. And as soon as he does that, the disease just goes away. Her pot pustules dry up and fall off. She stops coughing. She can breathe. You know, all good. All you may not understand this. I don't either. All we need is Nathan to come in and touch us and we'll be cleared of the floof. Anyway, um, he also does the same to Pastor Haskell and everyone else that is sick there. He heals them. And then he feels another colony spirit telling him and Marie to head for the city of Nabu, Illinois. There is a temple there. This is supposedly where Joseph and Hiram Smith were arrested and killed by a mob back in the 1800s. And they are to do a pilgrimage to Nabu. And so they start out on foot with supplies given to them by the Baptist to reach Naboo. So we're in Star Wars Phantom Menace. We're going to Naboo. Cut back to Aaron Shaw, who is visiting LDS wards where some people did not go to the camps. And he has this long diatribe about lap saints. So you could have completely cut that part out, Chad, and nobody would have been the wiser. And then we go to local reports talking about how the superstorm has wreaked havoc coast, coast to coast. It made it all the way to North and South Carolina and then is back out to the Atlantic. So it started in the Atlantic, it looped around and it went back to the Atlantic. It's a boomerang storm, y'all. Boomerang storm. Anyway, it's wreaked havoc coast to coast. So Aaron's back at work at the NSA data center. They tell everybody to gather in the conference room for an important addressed by the president and the president who is until this point yet to be named says that due to all the stresses on the country by natural disaster after natural disaster that he has actually invited the united nations peacekeepers in to help bring law and order food and medicine to help rebuild the country that these countries want to repay the usa for everything else they have done for other countries and that as a result of this to help them out he is introducing martial law no large gatherings curfew every night and that you are to report and basically surrender yourself to these un peacekeepers then he just cuts it off um, and then 
Aaron does this long diatribe in his head about looking around the room and seeing how many people supported this president and his call for real change and how he's betrayed them. So this president is obviously Obama. So Chad didn't like Obama. Oh, big whoop to do reveal. So anyway, that's when Aaron makes the final decision that, his, that both Denise and Carol need to get to the camp. Then we cut back to Garrett walking up, walking east, trying to get to Utah, but he arrives at San Diego. He figured San Diego actually had utilities. Remember the people that came there and recruited people that maybe he could get some supplies there. So he stops at San Diego, but he sees these strange vehicles and uniformed men unloading supplies and large armored vehicles. He's basically run into a contingent of UN peacekeepers. He kind of hides from them and kind of watches what they're doing, but he doesn't notice a Jeep with two Asian soldiers, that's his words, not mine, that pull up behind him and say, Garrett Foster halt. So these people have been tracking his chip. They all have chip detectors. And they take him into custody and they take him down to a Long Beach City Park under a pavilion where you have all these people that they've captured, essentially, lined up waiting to be processed. Now, these two, two soldiers come out, they sit at picnic tables with laptops, and they begin the process of basically processing everyone. Most of the people that were there that day were either homeless before any of this happened, or they were escapees from a local mental hospital, and all of them were taken into a building to the left of the pavilion. Right before Garrett steps up, there was a, a, a very attractive blonde lady, he said, that was taken up, and they run her chip, and they scan her history, and he overhears them say, so you were a professional dancer for the L.A. Lakers. And then they said, and she said, yes, is that a problem? He goes, no, I don't have a problem with it, but what I do have a problem with is that you're twice divorced, and... You've been living on welfare for the last four years, and you may not fit into our new productive society. Yeah. So she says, I can do anything. I can cook. I can clean. I can guard. He says, we'll have to evaluate you more. And he sends her into the left building. Now, it was about this time that Garrett relays in his head, I've only seen two people taken into the building on the right, a mechanic and a nurse. So... Skilled people to the right, I guess, unskilled people to the left. So Garrett steps up. They immediately recognize him as having military experience, and they actually invite him to join the UN peacekeepers as an American military representative, and that he will be treated well, and they need Americans in their force to breed trust. So, yeah. They take him to the building in the right, where they feed them and shower them, and prepare to give them, like, shelter and work assignments. He does ask what will happen to the people on the left, and the soldier simply tells him they will be taken to uh, one of the large outdoor sports stadiums and evaluated for skills to see where they will fit in. If they don't fit in, then other measures will have to be taken, and they never say what those measures are. But we, this is it, Chad Daybell, we don't have to guess too hard what those measures are. Those people are zombies. So we cut back to Aaron and Carol who have decided today's the day for them to get out and get to the camps. And there's two issues. They have to basically remove their chips so they can't be tracked and they can actually get into the camps. And they also have to ensure that no one's going to be looking for them. So basically, Denise and Carol have to fake their own deaths. So they suspect their house is bugged. So Carol says to Denise, why don't we go to Target and get that dress you wanted? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Little girl. So they hop into the car. They drive to Target. They go in. They shop. They get the dress. They come back out. They get into their car. And basically... Carol has a conversation with them, her saying that maybe it's time for them to go to the camps and get away from all this madness. And little Denise agrees. They go to the trunk. They open it up. 
They take a razor blade out. They remove their chips, bandage their hands. They each pull a backpack out, which is a, basically a bug out bag with food and granola, you know, granola or stuff like that in it. And they walk away, leaving the car in the Target parking lot. They get a, they get out of the parking lot up a hill heading for where they know a camp is. And Carol pushes a button and the car explodes. Now, I'm pretty sure in Chad Daybell's world, Aaron hooked this up because women only have the sense, don't even have the sense God gave a turnip. So we know Carol didn't rig this up. Probably Aaron did and then just taught her little feeble female hand how to press a button. I'm being facetious, y'all, but just his description of women and what they are fit to do in this book just sickened me. I mean, I think people that are mothers and housewives, that's wonderful if that's your choice. But no one should be forced into that role. You know, that's my whole opinion. I'm not like an intersectional feminist or anything, but just his, his, his he was very degrading toward women in this book, in my opinion. But I digress. So, Aaron gets a call from the police the next day. They show up to his house, tell him that his car was, was blew up at the Target, and they found the chips of both his adopted daughter and his wife in there, and that they suspect they must be dead. Well, Aaron puts on a good show of it being, you know, a tragic death to throw them off the trail. Then we cut back to... Nathan and Marie, who have, who are still walking to Naboo, they find a farm with some abandoned cars they're able to actually get by a draw of the spirit again, tells Nathan to check this 1979 Chevy Nova, which is actually my dream car, green, and they pick it up, they, they actually, he's drawn to it, they find the keys under the mat, they get into it, it actually cranks, and it moves with a half a tank of gas, and they start off down the road. They try to find information on the radio, but they don't. They make it about 50 miles in the car before it runs out of gas. But they finally make it to Carthage, Illinois, and I misspoke earlier. Naboo is not where Hiram and Joseph Smith were, were killed. It's Carthage, so I totally apologize for that. But... They arrive to Carthage, they feel a draw to go look at this jail where Hiram was shot in the face by a mob. Joseph attempted to jump out the window and was shot in the back while jumping out the window. They went to this jail, they went up to the second floor where it happened, they both burst into tears, had a religious experience, and then they walked on to Naboo. Finally got to Naboo, they're told by armed guards that they can't enter the temple. Nathan tells them that they're in, uh, he's in a mechanical missionary member and gives them the passwords and they let them on. They meet with an elder, Golding, there. And he actually says that they're welcome to stay there. They've got a nice little commune with plenty of food and stuff. And they are welcome to stay there. So they take them over to the town hotel where everybody stays. They Both of them made a big to-do about them not being married and they needed separate rooms. I mean, that was just a long two pages that didn't even need to be inserted in there. You could have just said they got separate rooms and been done with it, Chad. But, you know, maybe they were zombies. Anyway, so they each have a separate room. They have running water but no electricity. And then we cut back to Garrett, who's now working with the UN peacekeepers, they are tracking down people in Los Angeles. They, it shows them actually taking seven people and putting them in the back of a truck. But they found, he, they actually find a young girl who's just had a baby, a young Latina girl who's just had a baby. And the guards simply want to throw them in the back of the truck too. But Aaron, but Garrett thinks that the baby might be sick. So they actually take her to a hospital. He takes her in and gets her some good medical care. And she says she's going to name her baby after him. Again, a plot line that could have totally been left out of this book. Like I said, this book was about four hours on Audible, about 200 pages in print. I could have, I've eliminated about 10 to 20 pages already that didn't really need to be there. Anyway, Garrett becomes a big UN hero when he volunteers to read an announcement that will be broadcast from all UN vehicles. 
saying that they are only there to help to please surrender yourself at a local library or post office to get food and water and medical care and they broadcast his voice and people in Los Angeles come out and line up at these places and they're able to basically speed up their job because of Garrett's idea of actually promoting a, a message of peace rather than just rounding people up. And as a result, he rose through the ranks. He gets his own room at LA City Hall where the UN has set up temporary headquarters and he's introduced to a Russian commander of the UN task force named Pramalov who basically lets him in on their master plan, which is to anyone that is not skilled will be eliminated, killed, zombified, gone. Anybody that is skilled will be basically used as constricted labor to rebuild the United States. And then uh, Garrett asks, well, then you guys will leave and we'll have our country back. And he says, no, the USA has committed many, many sins. The UN will actually be divvying up the United States between uh, members of four countries that are members of a coalition that will control the United States from here on out. The United States will never return to its normal status that you guys lost. You guys screwed it up. You guys had it and you lost it kind of thing. And he says, so what you need to do is decide what you're going to be loyal to, a lost cause or the USA, or are you going to swear allegiance to the coalition and become one of us and so he says to save his own life that he'll become part of the coalition he takes this oath which he later says is the exact opposite of the missionary oath he took in the LDS church I'm not sure if that actually exists but in Chad Daybell's world it does so Garrett has become at least an unwilling member in the evil force in this story Meanwhile, Aaron is driving to his job at the NSA. A huge earthquake hits. The road opens up. He sees several of his co-workers killed on the highway toward the data center. A riot breaks out when the data center is locked down. They won't let the employees in, so they're trapped on this road, and the employees basically scale the fence and start beating the security guards. And that's when Aaron finally decides he's had enough. He basically walks down the road he finds an abandoned car he shatters the glass he cuts his chip out he wraps his hand in an abandoned jacket and decides it's time for him to go join carol and denise in the nearest camp while he's trying to get there and also we cut back to carol and denise trying to get there we notice that this earthquake has caused one of the large dams to break and so the entire valley that they're in is flooded and it floods towns it destroys more people and somehow they miraculously live through this meanwhile we cut back to naboo where marie is talking to elder golding about wanting to marry nathan that she's ready and he says well let me talk to him so basically he goes and talks to Nathan, and Nathan tells him he's really pleased with how Marie has given up the sinful life she once had, i.e. wanting a career, and is now ready to just become a wife and a mother. So they get married. They basically go through this whole endowment ceremony for Marie. They each have the questionnaire and stuff about joining the temple. Uh, Marie has to go through a question and answer session with Elder Golding, but Nathan has a endorsement from an elder that out, pulls out of his wallet that gets him in. I guess that's the get out of jail free card. And then they actually seal them in a ceremony and then they make a big to do about giving them the honeymoon suite at the hotel. Now, cut back to Utah where uh, Aaron is on his way to the camp. He passes a, a house that has actually been flooded but the family is trying to get two young people two young girls out of the basement that are drowning. He helps go through this house and helps them pull the girls out to safety. So, yay, Aaron, hero, those kids weren't zombies. And saves them. And then we cut back to Garrett and Pulmanoff, who are rolling into Utah to take over Utah. And Pulmanoff tells him that basically Utah, they suspect, will be the one state that will give them the most trouble. I guess they haven't ran up on Texas yet. <laughs> And they suspect that because he's from Utah, he can be a great benefit in reeling them in. So Garrett is basically rolling in to help them conquer Utah. 
there's this long thing about how the Middle Eastern countries as part of the plan has cut off all oil because all the U.S. oil rigs are down because of all the storms. U.S. is just without any energy at all. And it, they delve into more economic collapse. And then cut back to Nathan and Marie now on the road towards Salt Lake City because the day after their wedding, a mandate came down asking all MM members to return to Salt Lake City to Elder, uh, Elder Miller to help rebuild Salt Lake City after the flood. You also have Aaron arriving in Salt Lake City and making it to the home of Elder Bushman, the one he's been sending his coded messages to. And then you have Carol and Denise finally making it to one of the camps known as Wasberg that is actually running out of food. And so they decide they're gonna pray to take care of the food shortage, and they do. And then Nathan and Marie can't get into Salt Lake City because the roads are flooded, so they take another way. They actually make it to Wasserman where they are reunited with, uh, with Denise and Carol. And right before the book ends, uh, we're taken through a few more months where uh, the U.S. government has gone into hiding because of all the riots and pushback and rebellion that's happening. U.N. peacekeepers are arresting people and they're disappearing, i.e. being terminated, and the military can't help because most of our military is overseas helping in foreign wars. And then you look outside where a coalition of four countries, Russia and China and two other countries that have yet to be named, are waiting to invade the USA. So that's where this book ends. <sighs> I will be back soon with an analysis of a couple of podcasts as well as the third and fourth books in this series. And let me tell you, this was a hard read. I had to take several breaks. I barely made it through this one, but I hope I'll be able to make it through the others. They're a little shorter, so good. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll be back soon. Thank you so much for everything, guys. Guys and gals, I really appreciate it. You have no idea. Thank you so much. And until next time, Keto Cop.